So tonight we have a very full pack of great questions. So we're going to start with the first one. So um, this is from Hunt. He says, I saw my first starling murmuration the other day at about 5 p.m. The flock was large, flying south to north, and it made a quiet noise. How common is this in our area? And I think we have a little bit of video. So, Miles, you want to play the video? Yeah, and Phil, you might, you can go ahead and start talking about it while the video is playing. Okay. Now, is this, um, is this Hunt's video? <laughs> no, this is uh, just from YouTube of a murmuration. Got it. Okay. Uh, this is yeah. So, <laughs> so I'll try to describe what's being seen here a little bit. This is a mass of birds that is basically forming like a, almost a cloud in the sky. Probably just, you know, tens of thousands of specifically European starlings. This is the species that the murmuration, the word murmuration, which is a, a way that uh, it's a word that describes the sound that it makes. I've never actually witnessed this type of spectacle in um, which is, which is more known in Europe, uh, where these birds are native to. Um, we do have starlings in the U.S. They were introduced in the 1890s by Shakespeare enthusiasts, um, uh, a group of Shakespeare enthusiasts to, who wanted to see every one of Shakespeare's birds mentioned in his plays um, uh, located in, in the New World. So, um, so they were brought to Central Park. They were a super successful species. They expanded and their population today is estimated to be about 200 million in the U.S. So they're native to Europe, they're still there. Um, my suspicion is that if Hunt did see this flock locally, which somebody just asked, um, they're probably not starlings because we just don't have that many starlings oh. in the Pennock region. We do have large flocks of common grackles, however. Oh, and grackles are migrating right now. Um, grackles are, are a late fall migrant. They're here in the summer in numbers and in uh, swampy wetland areas, but they're migrating and staging now. This, so this was taken in California, it looks like. I just saw the, the end of that video. Uh, so yeah, there are large flocks of starlings in the U.S. as well. Um, but in a rural area like the Monadnock region, we don't have a lot of starlings. Um, we have a lot of grackles. However, um, yeah, with the grackle numbers building now, they fly to these communal roosts and they spend a lot of time um, getting there, uh, you know, migrating many miles to get to a place that has um, uh, safety you know, for these birds. So they, they're drawn together in these large numbers. Eric Masterson, in fact, has counted what might be the largest flock of, of uh, grackles in New Hampshire's history, an estimated 343,000 Eric counted back in November 3rd, 2009. I had to look that date up. I remember when he reported that and he was using photographs to document uh, and then, you know, measuring the time. Maybe Eric can chime in and describe how you actually, you know, did count that number if you're on the call, Eric. Um, yeah, that was in um, Portsmouth where there's a known roost of grackles in the fall in Portsmouth Great Bog. Um, when they like to, they like to roost in, in reed beds. And there was basically just a stream coming south from, I guess, the Great Bay area. No, uh, coming east from the Great Bay area. Yeah. And um, they were in a stream, so I was just able to take a picture. I was trying to do it with, method, method with, a, with a methodology that would, would stand scrutiny. So I'd basically take a picture every minute, count the number of birds, uh, the length of time it would, it would take the birds to pass through the frame, and then average out the frames and multiply them out that way. And I came up to 300 or 330, whatever, whatever the number Phil said was. Impressive. Wow. Yeah. So wow. you can see so, this roost uh, happening in, in late uh, October, early November in the seacoast area uh, from in the southern part of the Great Bay specifically and then roosting in the Great Bog in Portsmouth. It's probably the largest concentration of birds in New Hampshire period at any point during the year. However, I, I will talk about the starlings since this video shows a murmuration and, um, and that's really a, an event that's specific to starlings. And how do they move like that? Why do they do it? First of all, it's perhaps for safety in numbers uh, confusing predators. You know, when you see this massive swirl of birds moving like that, they're probably, you know, it's probably really hard to pinpoint one individual in there, which is what predators like peregrine falcons or merlins might try to do. Uh, so safety in numbers, it could have to do with uh, 
warmth, extra warmth in roosting areas where they spend the night. And it also could just be that these flocks gather and individuals will communicate about feeding areas at night. So they're kind of like bees, you know, finding food uh, is, you know, if they communicate when they come in contact together. So that those are all theories that are out there. We don't really know what they're talking about. We haven't figured that part out. Um, so but, mm -hmm. I just want to clarify. Um, so when you see that kind of formation, it's called a murmuration because murmuration. there's a sound attached to it that sounds like a murmur. Yeah, and it really describes the, the way the, the flock is shifting in shape. Um, and that's really what, what starlings will specialize in. Um, other flocking birds like grackles are not forming these big waves. They're moving pretty linearly from point A to point B, but starlings will have this shape changing way of gathering together. And, and scientists have shown, there's, there's a group of Italian physicists that study this, and they looked at um, uh, 400 photos and videos, and they plotted the positions of birds in relationship to an, each other. They found that any bird is keeping track of about seven other individual birds, so they're not colliding. Oh my so gosh. I don't know how exactly they figured that out. Wow, I almost feel like we should just end the call now and the whole Zoom because I always learn something and it's the first, this very first slide, I, I learned so much. It's amazing. That, thank you. And Hunt, thank you for sending that question in. That was fascinating. And Phil and Eric, thank you guys so much. Let's see what our next question is. Aha, it, I love this description. It looked like an ant with huge front claw-like legs. Francois, Jenna, what, what is this and should we be scared? No, we shouldn't, even though it has a really intimidating name. So this is a spiny assassin bug nymph. So let me just break that down. An assassin bug is an insect that has a beak-like mouth part and you can see it in the largest photo. Um, it's like a sideways photo of the head. There it is. Thank you, Miles, for pointing that out. That's its mouth, and it's going to inject that. It's going to stab another insect with that mouth part. It's going to inject some digestive liquids, and then it's going to slurp out the insides of the other insect. So hence the name assassin bug. This one is a spiny assassin bug. You can see where it gets its name because of all of its spines. And it's a nymph, which means it's a young one. So it'll, as it grows, these actually become a little bit less spiny. So the adult doesn't look quite as scary looking. Um, so this is, I of course had to do a little research on this because I wanted to know more about them. And this particular species of assassin bug is fascinating because it um, turns out that in the true bug order, um, one of the things that these insects are known for, not just this one, but others in this order of insects, um, use sound and vibration to communicate with each other. And I knew that about aphids and some other leaf hoppers and things, but it turns out that this one uses that mouth part to make noise, which is just amazing. So if you can imagine that mouth part is really what we call sclerotized, which means it has a very hard exoskeleton on it. It's really tough. So apparently the males of this species take that um, mouth part and they rub it on basically like sort of under its thorax, so on its lower chest, and there's ridges, and it makes a stridulation type sound. So much like a cricket or a grasshopper would make that sound with their wings or legs, um, this insect makes it with its mouth up against its thorax. So, and all of the data or all of the observations of this are when either males are looking for a better position in order to get, um, to try and find a female, or the male thinks that the other male has a better position for um, basically predation. So a lot of times these assassin bugs will be like on the top of flowers waiting for a little hoverfly to come, and then they'll, they'll really stridulate busily and aggressively when they want to like intimidate the other. So the article that I read said these were used for um, intimidation, the stridulation, or if the assassin bug is startled. So if it all of a sudden, and I don't know how they tested this, like let's scare an assassin bug and then we'll see what happens. Um, but they stridulate then as well. And right. I just saw that little question pop up and then go away. Um, the question was at what stage do they mate? They mate when they're full adults. So they would be, have gone through every one of their molts 
Um, I don't know how many molts this particular species goes through. Um, usually it's, you know, four to eight times that they molt their exoskeleton before they reach maturity in this type of insect. And then once they reach maturity, then they get to the point where all of their reproductive organs are developed fully and they can then reproduce. So yeah, uh, Eric, Eric has the same question I had. Um, I've learned two new words and it's only been like seven minutes into the program. One was murmuration and now you're saying what? Stringulation? Nope, it's a D, so I'll type it in the chat. Oh, sorry, my dogs are having. Strigulate, I thought it was strigulation, but it's not, it's, she's gonna chat it to us. Stridulation. Okay, so stridulation, is that the same way, sound, the way that crickets make it? Is that what that Well, is they're called? rubbing, I'm gonna close the door. My dogs are having a bit of a bonkers time. Um, it's the, well, crickets make it by rubbing one, like wing upon wing, grasshoppers wing upon leg, and these guys is mouth part against thorax. Wow. So it's basically a sound that an insect makes by using different parts of its body um, and it's like an exoskeleton, uh, well I, I just want to keep saying stridulation, but it's like an exoskeleton vibration sound. Wow, I think Miles, maybe at the end we need a test of all of our new vocabulary, <laughs> that next time we'll have a test with new vocabulary. Thank you, Jenna. Um, that was totally fascinating. And now I can't even believe what's coming next. So uh, this is another bug question for you, Jenna. Found oh, this uh, right away. In, yeah, what is this? Found this insect in our breezeway in Alstead last month. Might anyone know what it is from Trisha? So this is interesting because a bunch of people have sent me pictures of this exact insect all summer. So I don't know if this is a particularly curious summer for people just being home a lot, or if it's that there are more of them around, but this is a large tachinid fly. Now I'm gonna type that one in, hold on. Um, and there are a lot of, oops, see it's, it's um, auto-correcting me. Um, and there are a lot of these flies, many species, and- so this one has the very scientific name of large tachinid fly. I didn't, I didn't type out the um, scientific name, but this one is, it looks like something that would feed on dung or carrion, but it is not. This is a parasitic fly. So this fly is going to, it's gonna feed itself on nectar and it will then lay its eggs, if it were a female, onto another insect, generally speaking caterpillars with this species and that egg will hatch and the little baby maggot fly will burrow into the caterpillar and eat it from the inside out and then when it's done it will pupate emerge from the caterpillar caterpillar will die and we will have a full-grown tachinid fly so you can see why it would have to parasitize somewhat larger insects because it is a somewhat larger insect yeah, so Miles just is wondering, um, is they like just lay one egg on the um, caterpillar or is it like a whole bunch of eggs? Well, I think with this species, it's one, usually one, because it is larger. Um, I can check on that because there are some tachinid flies that lay a couple. Um, with, with parasitic wasps, um, which is also sim very similar in terms of what it does to a caterpillar or another insect, they sometimes will lay a bunch because they're very, very tiny wasps and so they can fit a lot into a caterpillar. But with this tachinid fly, I think it's just a one, maybe two, but I think it's usually one because it gives it a better chance. So. Wow, I like that. And I just want to compliment um, Trisha on the photograph, putting the penny in for scale. That's very helpful. Um, so if you're thinking of sending in some photographs the next time around, it's always good to put in scale so that we can get an idea of the size of the animal or sign. Thanks a lot. Let's see what's next. <laughs> I like this. Fungus? John, is this fungus or is it raisins or is it deer scat? I, it's, I mean, not, it's on a tree. The first thing to do is just taste it, right, Susie? We all know. <laughs> that. Pop a bit in your mouth. <laughs> no. Don't do that. Um, so this is definitely fungus. Uh, this is a nice photograph of 
uh, one of my favorite groups of fungus that you can find in the fall and the winter after uh, rain. And, uh, you know, when you have wet conditions, you find a lot of jelly fungus. So uh, these are a type of fungi that, um, you know, they're a saprobic uh, group, which means they decompose uh, dead wood, you know, specifically deciduous trees. And uh, this is one that has the common name of black witch's butter, which is a pretty good uh, common name to remember. There's also uh, the common, you know, um, yellow witch's butter, which people probably have seen too. And there's, you know, there's various types of jelly fungi and they tend to have this, uh, you know, gelatinous quality. After it rains, they absorb water and the fruiting bodies just expand into these cool uh, kind of, you know, um, growths with different different uh, shapes and textures. So actually, I looked into this one a little bit because I was curious to know exactly what type of black witch's butter this was. And, uh, you know, it, I think this is the one that is Exidia um, plana, which has what is called a cerebriform uh, growth style, which you can imagine cerebriform means brain-like. So you get these brainy looking uh, fungi. And uh, so this one actually, I think, is known to be more native from what I was reading to Europe, you know, like the British Isles and other places there. But really, I mean, with fungi, it's very hard to define their, uh, you know, boundaries as far as their, um, you know, the, the places their populations grow because their spores are just spread, you know, through through the wind and they can just colonize different continents. And many of the, our common fungi that we have here, you know, also grow in China and Russia and parts of Europe and all over the place because, you know, they can spread very easily. So I believe this is Exidia plana. And uh, so these are just fun. I mean, I always tell my students to poke them. You got to see what they feel like. It's a lot of fun. Uh, when it's dry, they just shrivel up the fruiting bodies. So you can hardly see them. But of course, the mycelium continues to, you know, uh, grow and digest the wood inside. Wow. And, uh, John, um, we're curious, how many different types of blacks, with black witch's butter is, are there? Oh, that's a great question. So I, I believe there's at least, you know, I mean, again, you have to be careful with common names because there's a lot of just different, you know, uh, it's a very uh, catchy name. So it's, I think it might be thrown around with different types of fungi, but uh, certainly within the realm of jelly fungi, I think there's at least three. I mean, there's Exidia plana, there's Exidia glandulosa, which has a larger sort of more lobe fruiting body. And you'll find that quite a lot too. Um, this one actually uh, is a little bit sort of like lighter and clearer looking than some other examples of uh, black witch's butter I've seen. So, you know, it can be quite variable, but uh, wow. yeah. That's great. And and um, we love the name around this time of year. It's perfect for Halloween. Thank you. And yeah, well, actually, you... hold on, Susie. Thank you for, for saying that because there's one other little thing I read about, which is yeah. apparently one of the, the theories about its name too, its common name, was that it was thought to possess the ability to uh, fight off witchcraft it was, if it was thrown onto a fire. I'm not sure if this is from colonial, you know, times in the Northeast here or from Europe exactly, but uh, apparently it does have some folkloric connotations with witchcraft. Wow, it still comes in so handy this time of the year. So everybody will need to find some um, black witch's butter before the upcoming All Hallows Eve. And also I hope you paid attention because cerebriform is now included on our vocabulary test as well. Let's see what our next question is. Big white pine cone year. That is really true. And this is such a good question. Why are the cones most concentrated near the top of the tree in the crown with much fewer on the lower branches? From Eric and Jeremy, what about this? And what can you tell us about this big white pine cone year? Uh, we will uh, we'll talk about the big white pine cone year in a minute. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that I have the complete answer to this question, but I certainly have a a, a reasonable answer to it, or at least gets us somewhere closer to there. So white pines are what's called monoecious, monoecious, as uh, compared to dioecious. So monoecious means a tree has both female and male flowers on the same tree, or in this case, male and female cones on the same tree. And you probably remember white pine cone, uh, white pine male cones you see in the, in the spring, late spring, so June, July, and uh, that's when you get the big pollen uh, releases and, and huge clouds of yellow pollen on, on the top of ponds and stuff around here. Um, but there's some, there's some value, to, if you're a monoecious tree, to separating where your male cones are from your female cones in that you don't want to self 
uh, fertilize. You know, we were always looking for genetic variation being being built in. And so typically white pine male cones are lower in the tree and white pine female cones are higher in the tree. And so we're, we're seeing female cones high in the tree. One value for them being high in the tree is that uh, if you think about the dispersal of those seeds, once they're mature, once the white pine cones open up and the seeds start to disperse, when they're high in the tree like that, they can travel much bigger distances. So they can colonize areas further away. So there's some real value to being at the top of the tree when you're releasing the seeds. Um, one thing that people don't often realize is that those cones we're seeing, the brown cones that we're seeing right now in this big cone year are, they're actually two and a half years old. So those started not last spring, or they weren't fertilized last spring, they were fertilized the spring before, and they've been maturing over that two and a half year period. So it was really the conditions of the winter and the spring before that led to the big white pine cone crop, not last winter and spring. And then finally, uh, yeah, white pine like, like uh, oak this year has had a tremendous mast year where there's just amazing uh, acorn production. We're stepping on it on trails all over the place. I got hit in the head with one yesterday, on a, not yesterday, but a, a week ago on a trail. Um, and we're stepping on white pine cones everywhere. Well, uh, there's a bunch of species that have these irregular mast years or big years of, of, of seed production. And the, the thought there is that it really enables them to uh, be out of sync with the predator base. So the predator base, if every year white pines produce the same amount of seed, the predators would be able to keep up with it and eat all of it. But if the, the white pines produce a little bit of seed one year and then tons of it the next year, the predator base isn't there. And so some of those white pine seeds will, will survive and grow into seedlings. And I think Susie's writing an article about that on, on masting oak, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure if it made it into today's paper, but it will be in um, backyard, our Backyard Naturalist column in the Monadnock Ledger, but it, it, I focused on acorns. Um, Jeremy, Linda had a really interesting question that I'm sure other people are wondering. Can you tell a male cone from a female cone when they're on the ground? Oh, sure. Well, we, we all have seen male cones. They look nothing like these mature female cones. Um, they're, they're kind of um, much, much, much smaller. Uh, they release the pollen, so they don't have any of the, the bracts, the hard components to them. They're just more like a sort of um, uh, a hops flower look thing. They're a soft, a soft cone in comparison. And they fall off the tree in late J June and July. And so we'll see huge uh, uh, conglomerations of light brown remnants of the white pine cones, white pine, white pine male cones after the pollen has been released. Very cool, thank you. And you gave us a new word for our, our vocabulary test, Monetius. So I really appreciate that too. And thanks for the question. That was a really interesting question and so appropriate because everybody's noticing the huge amount of pine cones and acorns, but pine cones in particular. And Phil was just telling me about birds um, from Canada are coming down here because we're having a big pine cone year. So Eric or Phil, do you want to just mention a few special visitors for people because of the pine cone crop? Not this sure, one, Eric. Yeah, it's been a huge crossbill year um, predating the white pine cones. It was a, um, a, already a good spruce cone year and a good um, hemlock um, year. So we had a huge, huge number of biggest, actually in my 20 years in Hancock, <clears throat> the biggest uh, crossbill year I can remember. Crossbills are a finch. They, they're normally pretty rare in this region or uncommon at best. Um, but this year, because their food is here, they're here in big numbers. And actually, um, Miles just asked a question, um, or he's in, a, in the chat, he stated that he thought pine cones were dispersed by animals. And I think you could argue to a degree that that might be true. Jeremy, if you want to chime in for, for white pines, although I'm not sure to what degree crossbills, they're a finch that are, they're, they're renowned for having um, mandibles that cross at the tip, which is very unusual in the bird world. I'm not sure to what degree they would, I'm sure they drop a few seeds, but the ones they eat, I would assume, are removed from the, the seed population. But Jer Jeremy, do you have any comment on animal dispersal of, of um, white pine seeds? There, there's certainly some of it, mostly in caches that get forgotten. So places that, that, that birds or, or mammals may have 
put a cache of white pine seed and then forgotten about it. So I didn't get back to it to eat it. But it's also, um, you know, just, just not a, it's a relatively heavy seed. So it's not wind dispersed long distances, but it is wind dispersed as the seeds fall as well. And so, so you'll get a, you'll get a carpet of white pine seedlings. That's not from animals. That's from, that's from just a drop in a wind dispersal. Wow, love it. Thank you guys. That was fabulous. And thanks, Eric, for adding the, um, the bird part. So uh, let's see what's next. Aha, I've been waiting for this question. Um, this is from Francie, who I just want to give a shout out to. Um, she's always giving us great questions and give, bringing us curious finds. And this was an interesting curious find. Would anyone like the complete skeleton of a porcupine? This is from Francie. And um, Francie, I know you're on the call. Can you just tell us um, uh, where you found it and why you brought it to us? Okay. Um, I found it on one of the beaver dams that is on my stream. And um, it was, first of all, covered in, um, you can see in this picture that kind of blackish stuff that would be um, um, some of the pelt. Is that what's the yeah. word I want? Yep, yeah, it's yeah, sort of the skin. The skin, yes. And there was some hair on it. And then on the face, particularly, there were many, many, many pine cones. Pine cones. I'm still in the <laughs> last slide. <laughs> Porcupine quills. Great. Yeah. So, so you found it and then you brought it to us. Well, then I brought it. Well, I sent you the picture and you said it wasn't ready. So I laid it out on my yard and let the sun dry it and things. And I was able to cut off all of the skin. And um, yes, yeah, so then I brought it to you saying, here, enjoy your porcupine. Okay, so now the story takes a strange twist because yeah. um, it's COVID, so we haven't really been in our office um, checking out these finds. But then one day, I'm going to let Brett and Karen Siever, can you guys tell us what happened next? Yeah, so Karen and I um, were at the Harris Center to do salamander surveys. And we were getting our, our stuff together and there was a box there and it said porcupine skeleton from Francie. And so we were taking a look at it. Karen manages our mount collection um, and I'm just interested in these sort of things. And we were staring at it very closely because we were marveling at the fact that it was still all articulated. Everything was still connected and it was entire. There didn't seem to be any missing parts. And so we were really just sitting there marveling at that and looking closely, and I was looking at it, and I, I saw, I looked at the tail, and I said, boy, this looks like a really long tail for a porcupine, and we were talking about it back and forth, and then we, we looked at it some more, and we found this other bone that is this one in that left-hand picture that Miles showing, and it's not a leg bone. We were talking about legs and how um, it was so interesting how all mammal um, legs have similar kind of structure in terms of the types of bones and we were looking at this bone and we said well that's not a part of the leg and it's not part of the tail what is that bone um and so we started looking it's it was kind of in the um pelvic area between the two legs and so like you do we took to google um and googled I, on a hunch i googled penis bone because I, that's what it looked like to me. And I didn't know if that was a thing. Turns out it is in many mammals. Um, Susie can probably tell more about that because she's familiar with this more than I am. Um, I'll let her chime in after I f finish this part of the story, but we're looking and, 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 and then I'm thinking, I still don't think this looks like a porcupine really. And I, we Googled, because um, I looked at a, a diagram of all the different penis bones in different mammal species and in the porcupine it's very small and in the raccoon it looks an awful lot like this, longer and more curved. And so I thought well I wonder if it's a raccoon and Karen googled raccoon skeleton and it looked exactly like what we had and then we looked of course again at the skull and looked at the teeth and 
you know, porcupines are herbivores, and so they do not have the need for teeth that are tearing. They mostly have just teeth for grinding. And so this, this animal, you can see, has teeth um, up front that are um, more, the teeth of an omnivore, of an animal that might eat meat and an animal that also might eat other things. Um, and so we're thinking, oh, I think we figured out it's a raccoon and we wondered, you know, but why did she think it was a porcupine? And we look more closely and we saw that there was a quill running right through the eye socket of this animal. And a lot of the other quills that Francie had seen were gone by then, but that quill remained, um, which led us to believe that this is a raccoon that had a, an unfortunate run-in with a porcupine and maybe that's even what caused its death. Um, but it was an amazing kind of natural history mystery moment for Karen and I just on our own looking at this skeleton in the Harris Center um, Coolish Room where we have a bunch of our natural history um, tools. And Karen, is there anything else that I missed that was important to add to that story? Well, all I would add is, well, I would add the, uh, the another name for the, or word for the vocabulary quiz would be baculum. baculum which is the name of a penis bone, an ossified penis, uh, which not all mammals have. But um, just to take us back to that moment of discovery, uh, Brett literally said, what's that bone right there? Um, so it was just one of those very uh, humorous and at the same time very revealing moments. And it was just, uh, great to share with a coworker to kind well, of figure it out together. So I love it. I love it. I, ha I have, as, the ma as a mammals person, I have a couple of things to say about the baculum. Um, and you might be curious if, if you have any young listeners, this might not be appropriate for them. Um, but I'll tell you, you might be thinking, well, why don't humans have a baculum? Or do they? But they don't. So humans as a mammal do not have a baculum. And one of the reasons or theories why um, some mammals have a penis bone and others don't has to do with the length of, um, of intercourse. So um, animals that, mammals that engage in long intercourse so we're talking 45 minutes, 90 minutes in which the male is, um, is inside the female. That's very hard to maintain if you don't have a bone to keep the male's penis st sturdy. <laughs> Let's say sturdy. And so um, the theory is that, they, that these animals that have this long duration needed um, or had evolved a way to maintain that. And why would it take so long? Like, why would they be mating so long? But if you think about it, the longer that you can stay in the female who's in estuous, the more likely that it's going to be your offspring that is born. So you're kind of locking her up or, or closing off the gate. And so that's the theory behind the penis bone, one of the theories that I've read about. Um, and I'll just end one last thing about the teeth um, of mammals in particular. I like to think of this, it's a saying that um, Mead taught me, um, my mentor and Harris Center, um, Harris Center guy. Um, he said, um, dentition defines diet. So if you want to know what an animal eats, take a really good look at its teeth and its teeth will tell you what it eats. And in this, if you look at it, it, it is not the mouth of a plant eater. It is definitely a mouth of an animal that has got uh, canines. And then those sharp teeth right behind the canines are carnassials or teeth for tearing up stuff. So Francie, thank you for bringing in such a mystery. And Brett and um, Karen, thank you for solving it. And I hope you all enjoyed this little foray into Baculums. <laughs> well, well, well negotiated, Susie. I'd love to see you give that talk to a group of first graders. Ooh, I don't think I would. <laughs> now on to something a little less racy, please. Um, these mounded clumps of soil, approximately two inches in height, observed in a low-lying wetland area at the Quabbin Reservoir in Massachusetts, happens to be one of my favorite places to explore, and sometimes are associated with a hole in the center or nearby, curious as to who makes this and why. So this is falling into my bailiwick because it's, it's a mammal, and this is a typical kind of mole hole 
And you might be surprised, why, why, why would a mole be making a hole and digging out stuff in wet soil? But there happens to be a type of mole that prefers wet soil, and that's the star nose mole. In New Hampshire and Massachusetts, we have three types of moles, the hairy-tailed mole, the eastern mole, and the star nose mole. And no matter what type of mole you are, you kind of make these mole hills, and this is a mountain out of a molehill, ha ha. Um, and the way that they make it is they have those huge front feet that are like shovels um, and they have claws, they're giant, they're like catcher's mitt. So when they're in the tunnel and they're excavating, they'll put one claw or paw out to dig and the other one is bracing the side of the wall. They kind of push it, push it, push it. They push the dirt, they dig, and they're kind of making a pile. They'll alternate paws, digging from both sides. They'll make kind of a pile behind them. And then they don't push it. You, a lot of times when you see a mole portrayed in like movies or TV, you see them push the soil out with their head. That's not exactly how they do it. Um, they are in the, the pile of dirt that they just excavated is behind them. They have to sort of go up, do a somersault, come back and face the pile, and then they put one paw out like a blade, kind of like a bulldozer blade. And they'll push that pile, push it, push it, push it, all the way through the tunnel, back to the first hole that they made, and then push it up. Um, and that's where you get the mole hill. And oftentimes they'll plug the hole, so you won't even really see the hole. Sometimes they might still be excavating, so maybe when Pam found the couple of holes nearby, there might have been an active mole excavating. And so um, I'm excited. And Pam, I really like how you put the number, um, the, the measurement down. You gave us a number. Oh, yeah. Uh, Phil's saying, those big paws serve as pretty good flippers, too. My son and I watched a star mole swimming, a star nose mole swimming. And actually, star nose moles mole are really great swimmers. And they eat a huge amount of aquatic invertebrates. Um, and they use that star nosy um, mouth, nose, that snout, kind of as a, it feels for them, those tentacles, there's 22 of them, they push those tentacles out and they feel the vibrations of animals and they actually have, they hold a Guinness World Book of Records. I thought this was held by my 16 year old son. Um, but they're actually the fastest eaters in the mammal world. So on to the next question. Let's see, what do we got? Oh, wow, this is crazy looking. John, uh, what is this? All right, well, this is a, a pretty cool photo, an interesting specimen here, uh, but I'm, I'm pretty certain this is the honey mushroom, Armillaria malaya. Uh, my first clue would have been just the clusters of growth and, and the fact that they're all coming from the base of a tree stump. Um, there aren't too many types of mushrooms that have that kind of growth that's all you know clustered together so tightly and then there's some other uh, traits you want to look for for honey mushrooms. Uh, they're named after the color of the cap, uh, not the flavor. The kids always ask me, hey, oh, it tastes like honey. No. Uh, but they are an edible mushroom uh, if you get them fresh. But uh, they're, I'll get back to that in a minute. But uh, for identifying them, they have the, um, you know, the sort of golden colored cap. They have some little scales on the cap. They have uh, a ring on the, the stem, which is also called an annulus, which is that kind of little skirt, which is a very distinctive feature of certain types of mushrooms, especially gilled mushrooms. This is a gilled mushroom, another important feature. Uh, you'll see those little you know, uh, ridges along the bottom where the spores are dispersed. And by the way, that is the basic purpose for every single mushroom, whether it's jelly fungus or a honey mushroom, is they are spore dispersal uh, reproductive growth. So they're fruiting bodies and that's their, that's their whole reason for being. So uh, this is, what's interesting about this uh, picture is that, you know, these mushrooms all look very young and yet they're getting pretty kind of crispy and, and not so healthy looking. So I think uh, this is interesting, you know, I mean, partially it could be due to drought. Sometimes mushrooms begin to grow, but it gets dry and the young ones don't quite fully develop. But also, um, a very important part of the uh, biology of the honey mushroom is they are largely uh, parasitic or pathogenic on living trees. And I bet, I mean, Jeremy, I'm sure knows a bit about these. Uh, they, they can be quite, you know, damaging to um, 
uh, tree populations. Uh, they prefer deciduous trees and specifically oaks, but they can also grow in coniferous trees too. And they, you know, effectively will invade the root systems and begin to deplete uh, nutrients from the living tree and get, you know, between the bark and, you know, start to cause root, uh, sorry, uh, heart rot early. And there's a whole, you know, uh, world of ambiguity when it comes to how parasitic a fungus is. And it's never a clear boundary always of, if it, is it a decomposer fungus or is it a, a parasitic fungus and some are just opportunistic. But this one is absolutely pretty um, actively parasitic. And uh, this one, I think it might just be on its last legs because that little stump there is just obviously not providing much for it anymore. So there just might not be enough energy for it to uh, grow into a full crop of, of honey mushrooms there. Um, Thanks, John. But, That's great. Yeah. Oh, so I, 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 I've been finding a lot of these just in the last few days. Just exciting. After I'll, the rain. One thing I'll mention is this one is often commonly mistaken for a deadly mushroom called the deadly gallerina. That's another uh, important thing to think about. You know, I mentioned it's edible, but this one is one that you have to be very careful about. It has lots of variation in its, in its the way it looks and the way it can, you know, appear. And there's also a, a lookalike that is poisonous. Wow, that's a really good tip. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. I think there might be another fungus question for you this evening coming right up. Can anyone name this fungus? It's about eight inches across and growing on the ground. It's so pretty, John. What is it? Uh, this is one that I bet a lot of folks recognize. It's called the tricky tail fungus or Trimedes versicolor. It is really one of our most common mushrooms uh, really across North America where you have uh, rotting logs and tree stumps of hardwood trees. You're going to have turkey tail and as the name suggests uh, Trimedes versicolor, there's quite a diversity of color and pattern that you'll find. So it can be a little bit tricky to know what is really a turkey tail and what is uh, another species. There's quite a number of similar looking uh, shelf mushroom species that you might mistake for turkey tail unless you investigate a little bit more closely. So these photos here are some really classic turkey tail. It's called a zonate uh, patterning where you have these little concentric rings as it grows. And th these are some ones that really exhibit just how colorful they can be uh, with these really, you know, cool patterns of blue and orange and brown, you know, reminiscent of a turkey's tail. Uh, and, but then it, it can be, you know, different at times. It can be thicker, it can be a little bit duller, but the key that you want to look for is you look under the cap. You always want to see what's beneath the mushroom. And for turkey tail, if it's a true turkey tail, it's going to have a smooth, uh, pore surface. I mean, you might not even see the, the pores, these tiny holes where the spores are dispersed, but you look closely and you can see them, but it's just kind of this nice creamy white color. And other mushrooms like the, uh, the violet tooth mushroom has little bristly teeth. Uh, there's a false turkey tail that will have just kind of a similar striped pattern underneath it. So if you want to know if it's true turkey tail, look for that white surface underneath. Wow, thanks, John. That was great. And I just want to say that's a beautiful photograph that you took that the slide is up right now. It's just gorgeous. And and, and um, if you ever do um, get a chance to see some of John's photographs, he's got such a great eye. So keep keep up the photography, John. Yeah, follow him on Instagram. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, guys. I'll, I'll give you your money later. Ah, you're welcome. All right, let's see what's next. Oh, on July 30th, 2016, I was out taking photographs in the garden early in the morning and found these bumblebees sleeping under the wild bergamot. It had rained in the late afternoon into the evening of the previous day, and it was my intuition that they used the bergamot blossom like an umbrella to avoid the rain. So my questions are, do bumblebees fly in a rainstorm? Do they sleep overnight? And for how many hours? This is from um, Joanne. So Jenna, this looks like a really good question for you. This is a good question and I'm not gonna be able to answer the whole thing because I know part of the answer. So part of the answer is um, bumblebees tend to not try to fly in a rainstorm. They do tend to use our plants as umbrellas. So that is why one of the things that people say all the time when you're planting for our native bees and actually for honeybees as well, honeybees can go home um, but they sometimes get caught and so they like to have a shelter plant and often honeybees are further from home than a bumblebee would be because bumblebees only travel about 500 feet from their nest whereas honeybees go many miles. So bumblebees will get often get caught in a rainstorm as well and they really um, water on a bumblebee's body gets caught between their fuzz so it makes it harder for them to fly. So they will try and hide underneath all kinds of different flowers and plants and leaves. So that's a great photo. I love this photo. Perfect. Um, as you. to if they sleep, I don't know the answer to that. 
We'll have to look that one up, get back uh, to you guys. Somebody will have to take it up as a study. Someone will. I'm sure someone probably already has. <laughs> probably. Yeah. Yeah. Great question and beautiful photograph. And it makes me think of summer, which I already long for. <laughs> okay. Ah, wow. This, this is an intriguing question. I found thousands of these in our bird bath every morning. Do you know what they are? Linda and Karen, I have a feeling um, that you might have some theories about these strange items. What do you think? Well, I can't definitively say. I have pondered this photo for a while. It, so here's some of my thinking. Um, at first I thought it could be some form of algae or cyanobacteria because it's in a bird bath and that's pretty common in shallow stagnant water. Uh, but this growth pattern isn't very typical. It's very flower petal-like. Um, so that got me thinking more about true plants. So I started doing research on um, a lot of our small floating aquatic plants like uh, duckweed and the, the whole Lemna genus. And I've zoomed in on this photo as much as I can and I, I the, all of those small floating aquatic plants would have a a tiny little root attached to them. So they still have a, like a small little root hair that's about the, the, the length and width of your eyelash. Um, I don't see those roots there. So then now I'm thinking um, higher plants, that this might be uh, vegetation that's getting blown in, dislodging from plants and getting blown in there. Um, sometimes it's thought that flowers are all brightly colored but a surprising number of flower and flower parts are green. So this, if you count the little kind of projections from each, uh, the center point, there's six. So six is um, in angiosperms, the flowering plants, right? Those six indicates what we call perfect flower, meaning it's symmetrical. So these might be the center part of a flower that's kind of broken off and then getting wind dispersed. It's a possibility, um, but it's still obscure. I'm not really sure. Um, it, you know, it'd be interesting to think that it, could it be something that's transported by the birds that's then incubating in the bird bath? So is it, is it bird dispersed or is it wind dispersed? I think that's a, a interesting question. So, I don't know. I've done a lot of trying to research this uh, and I can't find any photos on iNaturalist that look like this. Granted, it's, it'll be once we know more about what it is, but it's, this isn't something that uh, was very easy to track down. So Brett, um, Brett just offered a theory. She wondered if it could be caterpillar frass or scat that got blown in and then waterlogged and kind of opened up. So Jenna, what do you think about that? You might be the caterpillar frass <laughs> expert. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't, the caterpillar scat that I've seen in the past hasn't been so symmetrical. So that's my only um, thought there is that these are very, very symmetrical with their six little projections. So I, I'm with Karen on the plant matter. Wow. Well, I, I would just say anybody out in the um, Zoom audience here, um, feel free to um, chat your theory on what this is. Maybe it's um, space invaders or something, <laughs> something we uh, unexpected. Uh, shamrocks, beginning yes. of leprechaun hats. I don't know. So feel free to chat your theory and we'll say, Karen, thank you so much for working so hard on trying to figure that out. What a mystery. Yeah, Linda, our, um, Linda, this is a good question from Ruth. Linda, who might have put this question in, are you on the Zoom call tonight? Would you like to add anything? Um, yes, I'm here. Oh. Um, these, this went on for weeks. Every single morning when I went out to put fresh water in the bird bath, it would be covered with these little things. And I wondered if it was something that was dropping out of the trees. There's a variety of trees right over the bird bath, but it literally weeks, right? Yeah. 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 Spring. Yeah. Late spring. Yeah, so that, that was my question, the time frame. So kind of late spring, so kind of blossoming time or blooming yeah. time. Yeah. yeah, I think so. so. 
Could it be flowers from the trees? Yeah, I think that's what Karen, you're kind of suggesting. Yeah, there's like the center part of a flower that's right around uh, the stamen, right? The center part of a flower that sticks up. And then often the, there's a whirl of petals around that center stamen. And they actually kind of like will kind of come off all in a, you could, I've seen it in other types of flowers, uh, not th this exact one. So a lot of times trees that flower, their flowers are small and in a cluster. So this, this would seem kind of an appropriate size for that. So that'll be kind of a, a fun challenge. I will continue this quest <laughs> to figure out what tree, what tree this might have come from. So next spring, Karen will have to come to your house. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> She'll have to stay there all night and day until she sees it drop out. So very cool. And thanks, Linda, um, for adding some more detail to this mystery. Yeah. Well, That's thank great. you. You're welcome. We set that in many months ago, and we kept kind of punting it to the next Ask a Naturalist <laughs> because so many of us were so perplexed and didn't know what to do with it until we, we realized, <laughs> oh, we should ask Karen. So that's why it took us so long to answer your oh, question. Oh, I see. I <laughs> know what it was, and we were trying to figure out who, what it, what it might be and who would know what it was. So... That's that's well, great. we still don't know. So it's, it's still don't know. Fun to be stumped. I mean, nature has a lot of ability to stump people that have been watching her for a long time. And that's what keeps a lot of us coming back. So true. <laughs> Which is a perfect ending note to say, um, please come back on November 19th and send us some more of your amazing questions and finds, videos, um, sound clips, anything like that. Oh, wait, one last Question: Tony wants to know what kind of trees are near your bir bird bath, Linda. Oh, hemlock. Yeah, several hemlock, um, birch, beech, cherry trees, all kinds. But we have had this bird bath out in this area for years. This is the first year I've ever seen this happen. And like I said, it lasted for weeks, but I don't recall ever seeing this happen before. Fascinating. Well, yeah. stay tuned. So we'll have to <laughs> we'll have to have some more of this, and we'll look forward to seeing many of you in November. And um, yeah, please keep sending us your questions, and thank you all for coming.